Hello and welcome to Ministry to Muslims. I am Carmen and I'm your host tonight. Today we have the great debate. So today we are speaking with um, Louis Leinhart and our guest Nadir Ahmed. Louis Leinhart is a founder is the founder of Truth Defenders. He has been involved in preaching, teaching, evangelism, and apologetics since 1998. Shortly after his conversion from Zen Buddhism and belief in Darwinism evolution, he was influenced by the teaching of the late Dr. Walter Mar Martin, the Bible answer man. This fueled his interest in apologetics and polemics. Shortly thereafter, he also began to assist with an open air evangelistic ministry that was the main foundation for setting up his own ministry, Truth Defenders. Lewis has had the pleasure of evangelizing and open air preaching throughout the United States and other parts of the world, such as Newcastle, England, Mexico, and Panama. Lewis is an ordained minister of Faith Community Church in Irvine, California. Let's bring Lewis up. Hi, Lewis. Hello. How are you doing, Carmen? Good, welcome. And let me introduce um, Nadir Ahmed is a Muslim debater. And for the last 30 years, he's been engaging in debates with Christians, defending Islam and challenging the Christian faith. Nadir's main focus is the miracles and science of the Quran and has an open challenge for Christians to debate him on this topic. Let me bring up Nadir. Hi, Nadir, how are you? Pretty good, thank you. Good. Good to have you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, to the chat. This is for the chat. So we are glad you're all here to participate and watch, but I do strongly recommend that everyone is respectful towards both of our debaters tonight. There, we will not tolerate any kind of disrespect for either side. And you'll get one warning, and after that, you're gone. Um, we don't want any drama today. We just want to have a good debate, fair debate, and that's how we're going to keep it. Um, also, um, at the end of the debate, we will have a Q&A. So throughout the, throughout the debate, tag me or um, whatever channel you're on, tag, tag me on any of the channels you're watching, and I'll see it, and then post your questions, and we'll get to it at the end. And so tonight, our topic is Muhammad, epilepsy, and demonic possession. So... For you guys, I'm going to go over the, the the rules. So the rules are, in the beginning, we have the opening and you each get 20 minutes. After that is the seven minute rebuttal. After that is the cross-examination for seven minutes. And then the crossfire for seven minutes and then the conclusion for four minutes. Um, I really, I'm gonna keep time. So as soon as you guys, please pay attention to the bottom of your screen. I will give you like a three minute head up and then a one minute head up and then your time is up. So if you're finishing a sentence, I'll let you do that, but you can't go crazy over or, you know, it just messes everything up. So we'll stick to the time. And um, are you both agreed that Lewis is gonna go first, right? That's correct. <laughs> okay, so I will remove you from the screen, Nadir. And then Lewis, you're, you got 20 minutes and then it'll be Nadir. So, okay. right, have fun, guys. Thank you. Okay, hello, everybody. I am Louis Leinhardt, and our subject matter of today is Muhammad, epilepsy, and demonic possession. And because of our limited time, although I'm going to cite a lot of references, I'm not going to be exhaustive with them unless Nadir requests that. So I want to start by emphasizing very clearly that as Christians, Although we do acknowledge that there is such a thing as demon possession and that demon possession manifests itself in certain ways, this one of the ways being uh, epilepsy or epileptic like symptoms, the two are not united together as if every epileptic is demonic possessed or every demonically possessed person is an epileptic. So here in Nadir's uh, arguments with Matt Slick just recently on the debate, he made the assumption that we believe that if somebody shows signs of epilepsy, therefore they must be demon possessed. That's not what we believe. So what I want to look at is the history of Muhammad. Was Muhammad an epileptic? Was he a demoniac? Was he both? And based on all the sources that we can look at from the Muslim perspective, be they Shiite, Sunni, or otherwise, they clearly teach that Muhammad showed signs of both epilepsy and demonic influence. And uh, my personal position is that Muhammad was damaged at birth. He had a uh, frontal lobe damage that, from all the signs and all of the medical analysis of the narrations concerning his condition. 
it shows that he must have had some kind of an epileptic condition that was capitalized by the devil himself to use him in his weaknesses, his frailties, to bring forth what we know as the religion of Islam. And this is shown very clearly by all the sources from before Muhammad was born, through his parents, his lineage, his tribe, all the way up to his death. And we can see that with pre-Islamic Arabia. It was pagan. So in the environment to which Muhammad was birthed, it was a pagan environment. There was paganism. And we know that with paganism comes demonic activity. When the pagans worship their idols, their deities, there are, the Bible says very clearly that there are demons behind these idols, such as with Roman Catholics when they worship the images of Mary or the saints. There are demons behind these pagan idols. The Bible tells us clearly that God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We don't look to objects to reach God. We don't use them as objects of reverence in order for us to reach God. God is omnipresent. He hears our prayers. He hears our thoughts, our hearts. So we don't need idols. Not that there's anything wrong with images per se, but when you look at an object as an object, uh, as, as an, when you look at an idol as an object of worship, now you're going contrary to what the Bible teaches. So that being the case, Muhammad was born into a pagan environment. Muhammad's tribe was pagan. Muhammad's lineage was pagan. His parents were pagan. His grandfather was pagan. His uncle was pagan. And so all of these things influenced him. We know that from Islamic teachings that the jinn, what we consider to be demons, and a lot of Muslim scholars as well consider them to be demons, can and do interact with human beings. And a lot of Muslim scholars, in fact, the majority of Muslim scholars, will admit that demonic possession is possible and that demons can influence. And when I say demons, they'll they take that to mean jinn. And they have a concept of good jinn and evil jinn. That means good spirits and bad spirits and interact with humanity. But the evil jinn can, in fact, interact with human beings in a physical way. In fact, the Islamic scholars teach that if a human being engages in sexual activity with his wife, or in any other way, and does not say the bismillah. Satan partakes with them in the sexual activity. Now we know from Muhammad's own narrative that his parents were pagan and died in paganism. Therefore, when Muhammad was conceived, the devil was involved. The Bible, I won't get into the details of the description that's given by Muslim scholars, because we have an audience here that might be offended by it. But it's very clear that Satan is involved in the union of, of sexuality with the husband and the wife when they engage intimately, if, if they do not say the Bismillah. And since we know that Muhammad's parents were not Muslims, Muhammad hadn't come to the scene, he didn't introduce Islam nor the Bismillah, they wouldn't have said that. Therefore, when they engaged in sexual activity and produced Muhammad, Satan was already there from the beginning. Then we also know from Islamic sources that the devil, the shaitan, touches every human being with his two fingers, and pokes them, except for Jesus Christ and his mother Mary. Those are the only two that the, the Quran and the Sunnah speak of as not being touched by the devil. So that would include Muhammad as being touched. So the conception was influenced by the devil. The, while Muhammad was in the womb, just before birth, Satan touched him with his two fingers. Then we hear, according to the Muslim narratives, that when Muhammad was six years old, he had an episode with two demons that appeared to him. They threw him down on the ground, they opened up his chest, and removed what they call the, the part of Satan, some kind of a clot, some kind of a malady. And they did some kind of surgical uh, procedure in order to remove Satan's part from Muhammad's heart. They opened up his chest, they took out his entrails, they washed them with Zamjam water, and they supposedly removed the possibility of Satan ever influencing him again, because that was the doorway for the devil to enter into Muhammad and to influence him. So then we have him moving on along. Later on, when Muhammad receives his revelation, it says that he thought he was demon possessed. He was out going into the uh, cave, he would go into solitude, and he would meditate. And during one of those meditations, a demon appeared to him. That demon is, according to Muslims, Gabriel. But we don't know that for sure. That demon squeezed him, almost killed him, let him go, told him to recite, did this three times. And Muhammad eventually was released. He ran home to his wife, yelled at her, cover me, cover me. I fear I'm demon possessed. 
she put a sheet over him, and he was known as the sheeted one. When the demon appeared to him in front of his wife, his wife is the one that said, do you see this apparition? He said, yes. She sat him on her lap. She said, do you see him now? He said, yes. She exposed herself. She asked him, do you now see him? Muhammad said, no, he's gone. She told him, well, he's one of the good ones. Because if he was a battle, he would have stayed. We don't know that, uh, to what extent she exposed herself, but she exposed herself. So her test for there being a demon or a good angel was to expose herself and see if the demon would be entertained by that. Then we have Muhammad being suicidal. After a certain time, Muhammad stopped receiving revelations, according to him. He became depressed. He became suicidal. He would go up to a high mountain to toss himself off. That was when another demon appeared to him. It says that when he looked at the horizon, he saw a vision of an angel. He claimed it was, well, the Muslim scholars say it was Jibril, but that's debatable. Everywhere he would turn, the apparition would follow. This tells us that that image was in his head. Because if there's something in front of you and you turn your head, that it's not going to follow you. But for him, it did. Supposedly, the revelations that came to Muhammad were through the ringing of bells, the fluttering of feathers or wings. He would fall to the ground, he would convulse, he would foam at the mouth, groan like a camel, he would sweat on a, on a cold day. These are all signs that are consistent with epilepsy. This is why I'm saying it's not necessarily the case that it was one or the other, I believe it was both. That Muhammad had suffered from epileptic seizures and Satan capitalized on it and used his weakness and frailty to produce Islam. We have also um, Muhammad claiming that Satan gave, it, gave him some revelations that are considered called the satanic verses. One time when Muhammad wanted to have reconciliation between him and the pagans, he asked Allah to reveal something to him that would reconcile them. Well, he didn't hear from Allah up for a while, and then eventually he supposedly got a revelation. And during that revelation that he was reciting, and there are different ways in which Muhammad would receive the revelation. Sometimes he was told to recite. Some Muslims uh, are debated over if it was in his heart, if Jibril would re read it to him first, and then he would copy uh, Jibril, or if it was in his mind, or if he was reading it from something Jibril was showing him. So that being the case, when Muhammad was reciting a Surah 53, he came to a point where he spoke of the pagan deities, Alat al Uz and Manat. During that recitation, Muhammad said, these are the, the high exalted cranes, the Garani. Their intercession is to be hoped for or desired. The pagans heard what Muhammad said. They rejoiced. They celebrated. They picked him up on their shoulders. They paraded him around like a champion and said, Muhammad has come back to the religion of his fathers. So Muhammad became immortal. He apostatized at that point when he accepted the worship of the pagan deities or the intercession of the pagan deities and he bowed down in worship and the pagans bowed down in worship with him along with all the Muslims and the narrations clearly teach that everyone there did. And there was, was a great celebration and Muhammad was not aware of there being an interjection from the devil into his mouth to produce this result. Muhammad simply wanted something to reconcile. Well, it was the devil who reconciled him between the pagans and himself. It wasn't Allah. Because later, supposedly, Muhammad was convicted either from Muslims telling him, hey, you're telling us to do something you called shirk before. And shirk within Islam, attributing partners to Allah, is one of the greatest sins you can commit that's unforgivable. So Muhammad committed this. He committed shirk. He told the pagans that their goddesses and their intercession was accepted. They bowed down together. They celebrated. And it wasn't until later that supposedly Jabril, the angel Gabriel, came back and rebuked him and said, what have you done? You said a thing that I did not tell you to say. And all of the narrations concerning these satanic verses, there are over 50 primary source materials, which I have the list up here, clearly stating that Muhammad did this, that this is a fact of history concerning Muhammad, if the narrations are valid. As a Christian and having studied Islam historically, and read the books and heard the scholars, I don't really believe that the majority of the Islamic narratives are, are true historical accounts, but it's their accounts. They believe it to be true. 
And therefore, we have to say, since you believe this to be true, let's follow your belief, your religion, your philosophy consistently. And according to Muhammad, he himself committed shirk, something Allah was supposed to protect him from. When his clot, his heart of Satan was removed, that was supposed to have protected him from the influence of the devil. Apparently it didn't work because Muhammad later, after his prophetic calling, was able to be influenced by the devil. Now, in order for this, for Muhammad to feel justified because he was depressed, he was very down, uh, probably suicidal again, he received a second revelation to excuse him and give him comfort that, oh, don't worry about this, Muhammad, because all of the prophets before you have had this happen to them. It says that none have come before you, but that the Satan has thrown into their recitations or their narratives or their hearts. So Muhammad conveniently got a revelation that said, you're not the only one. Everyone has this happen to them, but it's only a test. Well, what kind of a test is that? That Allah would allow his prophet, his best prophet, his example for humanity to be influenced by the devil in such a way that contradicts earlier revelations that he was protected. And then we take the account of the devil talking to Allah and having a discussion saying, because you allowed me to get kicked out of paradise or you kicked me out of paradise, I'm going to go after all of your righteous uh, followers. And Allah said, you're going to be able to, but you're not going to be able to do it to my righteous ones. So now we have a dilemma. Was Muhammad a righteous, devout uh, slave of Allah? If he was, Satan shouldn't have been able to touch him. Since Satan did touch him, either Allah lied, made a mistake, a blunder, when he said he would protect his righteous followers, and specifically Muhammad, because Muhammad is exalted, even though, here's another contradiction, even though the Quran and Islamic literature teaches that there's no distinction between the prophets, Muhammad is put aside and made to be almost equal to Allah, and if not at times greater above Allah, because we're to follow, or the Muslims are to follow Muhammad as they follow Allah, and they're to emulate him in every practice. The Islamic material is, it's exhausted on the life of Muhammad. I have here with me three or four different biographies on Muhammad, from the earliest ones to some of the most respected ones, and all of them report the satanic verses. They might give slight uh, variations, but the core narrative is there. Muhammad was influenced by the devil to the point of committing shirk. He became a murtad, an apostate, which is punishable by death according to Islamic jurisprudence. The highest authorities in Islam from the four major schools of thought, all agree that the person that commits shirk, if he is sane and apostatizes, should be killed. So the question is, was Muhammad sane? If he wasn't, then he would be excused, but he needs to make atonement for it. If he wasn't sane, why do we follow him as a prophet? If he was able to be so easily influenced, if Muhammad could not differentiate the revelations from Allah, from those of the devil, when can we trust him? When can he trust that angel that's coming to him and giving him, giving him this, these revelations? Then we have the Muslim comments that, or the Muslim position that the Quran is the word of Allah. In, in what sense? We have an entire chapter dedicated to the devils, the jinn, where you have the narration of demons speaking. Are those narratives that the devils are speaking, where they're talking, is that the word of Allah? Can you truly, as a Muslim, say the entirety of the Quran is Allah's word? Because as Christians, we don't hold to the same uh, apologetic as the Muslims. We don't view the Bible the same way the Muslims view the Quran. We don't view inspiration the same way the Muslims view inspiration. So a Muslim cannot turn around and throw these arguments back at us since we do not have the same uh, line of thinking, the same argumentation. And this is what Christians need to understand. When the Muslims try to turn things around on us, you have to remind them that we don't have the same foundation. We don't have the same way of doing apologetics, the same way of doing exegesis, the same way of interpretation. And coming to interpretation, again, I'll mention the year's debate with Matt Slick. He was mocking Matt, Matt Slick for interpretation, interpretation, interpretation. Well, I want to know how Nadir is going to interpret all of these narrations. Because if he does not like people interpreting what's there, and I have quotes from the Muslim scholars that say that when you try to take something and turn it into a metaphor or something other than what the clear context is teaching, you're erring. 
So they want you to simply take what's there. Take the narrative and leave it alone. Don't do any innovation. Don't manipulate it. Don't interpolate. Simply take it for what it says. And what the narrative says within the context of Islam, of the Quran, of the scholars, is that Muhammad was demonically influenced. And what was the product of that? Muhammad was led to a life of debauchery. Muhammad was led to a life of sin, a life of rebellion, a life of contradiction, a life of absurdities. All of the things we have concerning Muhammad that give us his biography, his life and conduct, he broke all ten of the commandments. In fact, there's narrations that clearly teach that Muhammad commanded the breaking of all the, the ten commandments. The Bible, the Quran says that it comes after the revelations of the previous prophets. But when we look at these other prophets that we have in the Bible, because the Quran doesn't just stay with the Bible or the Christian and Jewish writings, it goes into other writings, Muhammad contradicted them. Wherever the narratives from for the Quran came from, it wasn't from a true angel of God, and it wasn't from God. It was from a demon. Muhammad engaged in sexual immorality. He engaged in violence to the point of clear contradiction to what we see within the biblical narratives. We can explain as Christians clearly the wars in the Bible, the times that there was physical force uh, necessary. We don't have as Christians a mandate to engage in warfare to engage in physical altercations. What we have in the Bible is a mandate to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the way of salvation. Only in Jesus Christ, the true living God incarnate, can you find true peace. Muhammad did not have peace. Muhammad was always going through the suicidal tendencies. It says that through his entire span. In fact, Muhammad was Muhammad's end. Let's, take, let's go there as time runs short. Muhammad was told by Allah, if you say something that we have not spoken, I will take you by your right, by your hand, and I will sever your aorta, which is your life artery that goes to the heart. Now, here's what we have to ask. How did Muhammad die? Well, according to Islamic history, Muhammad died by being poisoned and having a years long suffering because of the poisoning to where on his deathbed he was shouting in agony to his wife that he felt as though his aorta was being severed. And then we got to say, well, if Allah is not the true God, how could he have predicted that that's how he would kill Muhammad? Well, we have to look at how the true and the living God works. At times, he, well, always he has the last laugh. And with Muhammad, he certainly did. Because he allowed Muhammad to die the very death, Muhammad said, would be the death of a false prophet. Someone that was influenced by demons, he introduced a demonic religion, a demonic cult that for 1400 years has brought nothing but pain and suffering to the world. And all we can do is take their narrations and let them examine them. Uh, do I have one man left here? I'm good. I can close with that. Okay, great. Thank you. And we will bring up Nadir. Okay, you have um, 20 minutes and then make sure you take a you know, you paid attention to the screen, so we let you know when there's three minutes, one minute, and time's up. You're all set. Well, thank you so much for that, Lewis, um, for all those fabrications. <laughs> so a lot of what Lewis said is fabrications. He's just making stuff up. Listen, let me explain to Lewis how debates are supposed to work. When you cite that this thing actually happened, you should show the reference, like what I will do tonight, and you should say, look, right there in your book, it says this. Now, I try to keep track. Not everything, what he says is a fabrication. A lot of it was just his wacky, quacky interpretations. But now what we have here, what's complicated about this debate is what is true from what Lewis is saying and what is stuff which he is just making up. But in, in reality, I don't think he's making it up. I think he's just going to like anti-Islamic website. He didn't do his own personal research to find out if these things are really true or not. So he just, I think that's basically what's happening. But here's a list of some of the fabrications. He said he died from his aorta being cut. This is nonsense. There's no reference for that. Uh, he said he couldn't differentiate between, uh, you know, a satanic verse or, or, or one from God. Uh, Satan removed his heart. I mean, the list goes on of all this nonsense and fabrications which do not exist in our text. 
which, you know, I don't know what to do at this point. Just tell them, uh, stop making stuff up. <laughs> okay, so anyway, this is really one of my most favorite topics. And like I said, you know, when we quote uh, uh, references, you should share your desktop, show what you're quoting so we can see and make sure that these are really authentic and what and, and really exist. So, yeah, so like I said, you know, um, this kind of goes back to 30 years ago when I was a student in, uh, as a religious studies major. You know, I made an amazing discovery, actually. And what I discovered was, you know, I was looking at my, my religious studies textbook, and what I discovered was these religions can all be true. There's no way you can have over 100 different messiahs, dozens and dozens different prophets. You can't have like a holy trinity and the monkey god Hanuman from the Hindu religion be inducted in the holy trinity. All these religions are contradicting each other. There can only be one true religion or none. You can't have the two. So what I've come to the conclusion, and this is what I'll base the entire premise on, there's a lot more alleged demon-possessed prophets. It's pretty much everybody in that, in that book is a demon-possessed prophet, is a false prophet. I couldn't really say that at that time, back in the 90s, because they believe that all religions are true and you, everyone has their own special truth. So I just kept my mouth shut, you know. So, but thank you, Lewis, for giving me this opportunity where I can voice my opinion. And so that's very, it's a very tough pill to swallow that, uh, you know, that everybody is a demon possessed prophet, except one or none. So I want to share my, so if you can go with me along with that, and I think Lewis will go along with me on that, there can only be one truth. We can now start to build the profile of that demon possessed prophet, and let's see what he looks like. So here we go. Can you? Uh, uh, I'm sharing my desktop. Uh, Carmen, could you uh, show that to the screen real quick? Thank you. I'd appreciate that. So this is the profile of the demon possessed prophet, and what we're going to find is that they walk and talk very similar. Now I only have like six examples here, but really this is a snapshot of over six. Oh, I'm sorry, over 100 demon-possessed prophets. We start with that premise. Now, I know some of you thinking, here, what? Guru Nanak? Apostle Paul? They're on the list of the demon-possessed prophet? No, he's Guru Nanak. I understand I'm, people might feel offended. I'm, let me explain to you why he's on the list. Because if, even though he did not call himself a prophet, and Apostle Paul didn't call himself a prophet, but in reality, they are. They're claiming to receive a divine revelation, and they produce scriptures. They're, from a practical point of view, Guru Nanak, Apostle Paul, they're all prophets. And they're, why they are on the list is because they, is because they fit the profile of that demon-possessed prophet. What can you see? And here on the top list are the demon-possessed prophets, and here are all the demon-possessed messiahs on the bottom. Again, I only have six over here. But this is a snapshot of over 100. I, I couldn't fit all that, all those people on here. So here is what we know. Here's what we now know about that demon-possessed prophet. They don't question the revelation which comes to them. They immediately accept it. Look, listen to what Joseph Smith says when the and, and the reaction of the revelation is given in yellow. Listen to what he says. I knew it. I knew it. That God knew it. I could not deny it. So when this beam of light came to him, they don't question it. Remember what, what uh, Lewis was saying. He said people thought, he thought, could this be demons? Point number one. Not because there was something evil about the angel who visited him. So that should refute what he says right there. Because it's something supernatural. He felt allegedly suicidal. Now, these are references which people say are weak hadith, actually fabricated, but that's okay, no problem. I like it. Uh, but I have to warn you, they are not authentic references. Why do I like it? Because that's not the characteristic of a demon-possessed prophet. What do you see here on your screen? They all lovingly accept and, and, and do not question. There's no pushback on the so-called revelation that they, that they are supposedly receiving. Blind acceptance without question. Of course. Let's look at this demon-possessed prophet, Apostle Paul. This is the funniest one. So he's supposed to be a persecutor of Christians. And then supposedly Jesus appears to him. Who are you, Lord? You give me a, what do you mean? Who are you, Lord? 
you are supposed to be like, hey, I hated you. Or you're supposed to like, who are you? Why are you immediately affirming he's Lord? He's making the same dumb mistake Joseph Smith is making. Let's look at Guru Nanak, his revelation. He said, he, as soon as the Lord of, you know, God appeared to him, he was so filled with love of for what are you guru, guru that he's saying the following verses. So here we see, we could see a pattern emerging. Muhammad's name is not on this list because he doesn't fit the profile of that demon possessed prophet. But let's go along with the whole suicidal thing. Okay, wonderful. That's exactly. That's exactly what we want to find, that you're troubled. What is this angel that's coming to you? Oh, my God, why are you harassing me? Please leave me alone. That's exactly the type of discerning, rational type of response that is we don't find in those hundreds of prophets. That's why he's not on the list. All of what you have described, actually, what Lewis has described, doesn't fit the profile of the demon-possessed prophet. So actually, Lewis's presentation has backfired upon him. He has shown how Muhammad is unique. Now, I want to talk about this satanic verses, which he was quoting, because this is really the death blow for his case. OK, now, again, this is uh, these are not authentic references, but it's OK. No problem. He's, he wants us to accept us as references. I mean, as authentic, it can be very easily refuted by simply pointing. And I can assure you, he has never read the story. He has never read it from its original source. Uh, the the, the the scholar Jalalain, if you look at my reference on my screen right now, he he points out a very important point here. He says, whatever happened about, you know, this is supposedly he was in prayer and then Satan threw some words on his mouth. Listen to what, to what Jalalain says here. It was without the prophet being aware of it. He didn't know what was going on. So the whole argument falls to pieces right here. OK, but let's go along with this with this to show you how this is destroying his argument. If Muhammad was a demon for this prophet, then what is Satan doing throwing revelations in his mouth? So the whole thing is from Satan. <laughs> the whole Quran and all of Islam is from Satan. So what's this whole episode? It's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. You're taking stories and narrations from our Islamic references and trying to uh, spin a demonic spin on it, it doesn't work. There's only one way you can intelligently read it, and that he is a true prophet of God. He is a true prophet of God, and thus uh, he uh, Satan tried to do some kind of attack upon him. And, and that's the only intelligent way. If, and another point, go back to our profile. This is a snapshot of over a hundred different prophets and messiahs. That does, we know Satan doesn't do that to his prophets. We know that. Their immediate acceptance, let's go back to, to, uh, to the demon possessed prophet Joseph Smith. I knew it. I knew that God knew it. And I could not deny it. There's no, you know, all of what you've cited doesn't happen to demon possessed prophets. So that actually has backfired upon him. It just doesn't fit the profile. And then finally, he has only quoted a small part of the story. He forgot the part of the angel appearing. So this is a story of both the devil and the angel. The angel then appears to uh, appears and consoles Muhammad and he says, basically, that's okay. You know, whatever Satan tries to throw in, you know, God. And let me. And I want to get you the. I want to get you the actual uh, reference in front of you. Please hit pause on your YouTube on your YouTube so you can just kind of read it yourself. I can't go over it real quick. It says, whatever Satan throws in, you know, God will uh, abolish by sending angels and revelations and consoles him. So he said, you should accept this as authentic. Okay, do you want us to accept that the angel basically came to Muhammad as well? All righty. <laughs> if that's what you want us to accept. You see, he only quoted half the half the story but if you want us to accept it then this is backfired upon him because of the whole moral of the story is this listen don't worry about muhammad he human beings can of course you know uh are are, are not infallible this is a religion which is protected by god and angels will come and descend and protect any kind of satanic uh you know intervention intervention so this is god is in control you know, if you've ever seen those T-shirts, that's exactly the moral of the story. And Lewis said, you want us to accept this as authentic. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. No problem. So that should pretty much destroy his whole. Pro now, I didn't get a chance to respond to everything because, and, and I'll respond to the whole thing about the aorta stuff, which is quite easy to respond to. But like I said, it was all fabrication to begin with, but uh, that's okay. So, so let me move on by giving you the smoking gun evidence. And this goes back to what uh, what actually started this debate was the Matt Slick debate, which Lewis was uh, challenged me on. And I did mention to Lewis, you're going to need to answer the scientific evidence for Islam. So what is this? And, and I made that as a condition for him. And so what exactly is this scientific evidence which I'm talking about? Okay. Well, in, in addition to what we have seen, what else do we know about the demon-possessed prophet? You know, is that he brings misery and suffering and death into the into the lives of those people who accept him as Lord and Savior. And what is astonishing about the Prophet Muhammad of Islam and the miracle which I'm about to show to you today is that Muhammad alleviates and rescues people from the suffering and misery of that demon prophet which the Christians follow. Now, before I begin, let me share my desktop over here. Before I begin, I want to make it very clear, we as Muslims, we believe in Jesus as a true prophet of God. He was the Messiah. But unfortunately, the New Testament has a demonic version of him. This, what you are seeing in your in front of your screen, if you, uh, I can share my screen again, Carmen, if you'll allow me to. This is misery. This is suffering. This is misery and suffering caused by the demon-possessed prophet, which the Christians follow. Let's take a look. Now, what's very interesting here, you will find in the New Testament that you will find, allegedly, Jesus talks about mustard seed, uh, alcohol, epilepsy, and we'll get to that, uh, and we'll get, and as well as meat consumption and many other things. Muhammad comes and talks about those same exact things. Let's see who does a better job. We go, let's go and then see how, uh, allegedly, if how the demon possessed prophet does against the true Lord and Savior. Let's see how that works. So, science today tells us. So basically, the Quran condemns alcohol in chapter 5, verse 90, as you can see on your screen right there. Science tells us that, the, and this is, I'm quoting from, the, from, a, from a scientific journal. This is the uh, European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry article. And just please hit pause on your YouTube screen to get all my references. Listen to what science says. Because of the Islamic faith, Muslim women are 50 times lower than the global average to, than to give birth to a fetal alcohol child. This is a child born with, with defects because the mother was drinking alcohol. Muslim women, and they, and they gave the credit to the Islamic faith, but it continues. Uh, where the population, uh, in contrast, wine is a, is a part of communion in the Catholic faith and abstinence is much less common. So the point of the article here is if you want to study this disease, you got to go to the Christians. That's where you're going to find it. So here's a question for Lewis today. How do you explain that an alleged demon-possessed prophet saved millions of children from fetal alcohol syndrome while the true Lord and Savior let them perish? Now, some say, okay, but you see, there's some good in alcohol. There is some good in it. It can help you with your heart. But this is a lack of understanding of science. Although there is some good in it, the overall evil outweighs any good. This is what science says. So there's no need to even try to bring up some good stuff about alcohol. Because okay, the evil of it, and this is the article I'm quoting from, CNN article, no amount of alcohol is good for your overall health, global study says. Now, many studies have shown that the overall health risk of drinking alcohol outweighs any benefits. Look what Allah says in the Quran. It says inside chapter 2, verse 219. They have some benefit for the people, but their harm is far greater than their benefit. Word for word agreement with modern science. So the question I, I, I would ask again, you know, of, of Lewis, how do you explain an alleged demon-possessed prophet saving these millions of children while true Lord and Savior let them perish? You see, it is not Muhammad who's fitting the role of the demon-possessed prophet, but your Lord and Savior. That's the only way you can understand this. Okay, let me give you another example so you, to better understand this analogy. Let's say there's a boy who is choking, and Jesus is just watching him. And he's like, oh, uh, uh, he's just, and he's just watching him, just watching him. 
a minute later, Muhammad comes in and says, oh my God, what's going on? And rescues the boy and pulls out that whatever thing is from his throat and saves the boy. The question is, everybody would look at Jesus and say, well, what are you doing? Why didn't you save that boy? That's So you see here, who's fitting the profile of the demon for this prophet? It's not Muhammad. So we see, now we know why there's a similarities between Islam and Christianity on these issues of alcohol demon, and, and, and epilepsy. So let's now, uh, let's go to epilepsy because uh, that's what kind of sparked this whole debate. So let's see what Muhammad and Jesus have to say about epilepsy here, okay? You got about four more minutes here. So the, 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 the misery and suffering doesn't appear to end over there. Well, what we now know from science is that Science tells us that uh, there, there's another problem with the Bible. And that so basically it, it's creating the same kind of confusion we have between the flu and COVID. You know, they share the same symptoms. So some people who have COVID think they got the flu and vice versa. So as a result, many people die because they share the same symptoms. So we got the same problem with, with uh, the Bible now because the Bible in Mark chapter 9, uh, 18, presented a boy who is allegedly demon-possessed. But guess what? Okay, in 918, it starts listing the symptoms of this so-called demonic possession. And guess what? <laughs> They're the same symptoms of someone suffering from epilepsy. So as a result, now these people are getting, uh, what's it called, uh, uh, stigmatized and being viewed as being epileptics. Listen to what the scientific research has to say about this. This is by Dr. Carl Oten-Nakin and Mia Tuft. And in the research article, uh, and these are two neurologists, they say it's a Christianization reinforcing the beliefs in the healing of rituals. The New Testament describes how Jesus healed a boy suffering from lunacy, epilepsy, and Jesus rebuked the devil. Okay, so they put the blame right onto the New Testament. Let's read over here in the next reference, which I have here. Uh, which I can't find anymore. <laughs> okay, I'll find it for you in just a second. But science today has made it clear that, unfortunately, the New Testament is causing this confusion between uh, people who have demonic possession, allegedly demonic possession, and, epile and epileptics. It's, it's making epileptics look like they're demon-possessed because the New Testament said they share the same symptoms. Now let's go to Prophet Muhammad. An epileptic comes, or someone suffering from seizures, come to him, and now this is a, does Muhammad accuse this guy of being demon possessed? No. Listen to what he says: "I will invoke Allah to cure you." That's it. Now this, now this has had a profound impact because those ignorant Muslims who believed, and other people who believed that they were that this is a result of demonic possession, that actually challenged their faith. They're like, "What?" Muhammad didn't accuse him of being demon-possessed. In fact, that was a discourse which was just happening today. I'll, I'll read that to you over here in this article over here. So Islam is working to dispel the myth, this harmful stigma of which epileptics suffered from, that they were demon-possessed because they are sharing the same symptoms. Muhammad works to abolish that. So here we, I only given you two examples because my, my time is up, but I'll give you more examples here. But I think from these two examples we see here that, unfortunately, the demon-possessed prophet is the one who stigmatized vulnerable people who suffer from disabilities, thus leading to their persecution. That's the work of the demon-possessed prophet. All right, now again, we believe in Jesus, but the version of Jesus in the New Testament is not acceptable. Okay, to cause so much suffering and misery to vulnerable people, to look at people's disabilities and say, I think you're demon possessed. Because when you go uh, uh, and foam's coming out of your mouth, the Bible's in, inside Mark chapter 9 18 says that's the work of demons. He's that okay. demon possessed prophet. Okay, thank you, Nadir. Obliterate that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so this next phase, this next round is the rebuttal. And Lewis, you will have seven minutes to. Get your rebuttal out. Okay, thank you. It sounded right. like Nadir jumped ahead and gave his rebuttal already. But, okay, he started going off topic, talking about Paul and other so-called prophets. That's of no interest to me. The subject tonight is Muhammad. That's the beginning of the title of the debate. Muhammad, epilepsy, demonic possession. 
So I'm going to stick to that. But first, I want to give Nadir a warning from his own authorities. A lot of people are, might not be familiar with these works. These are the reasons and occasions of the revelation of the Quran, and this is one of the oldest and most authoritative sources on that, which is a book that tells you why a certain verse or chapter or verse in the Quran was revealed. It gives you the background. It doesn't give you for the entirety of the Quran, but it gives you for the majority of it. And it tells you why revelation was given, in what area, what context, what time period, so that you as a Muslim don't make a mistake and misrepresent Allah, and then Allah does to you what he did to Muhammad and sever your aorta. And I'm going to give Nadir the warning from his own scholars that tell you on page 10 of this one, and I have, have the two most authoritative ones. He says, I don't read the sources. I couldn't bring a truck with me to bring all the materials I have on Islam by Muslims for Muslims. But Nadir, I have read the sources, and I'm going to read them to you now. Here's the warning, Nadir, concerning your lack of understanding of the narrations in the Quran. Don't speak out of ignorance. It says, it is not appropriate to speak about reasons of revelation except through the narrations of those who were present at the time of the revelation and knew the causes and thought their explanations and sought their, their explanations with perseverance. The doctrine of Islam threatens you, Nadir, the one who disregards or is ignorant of this science with the punishment of hellfire. So you need to be really careful because you believe this to be true. I don't. But your own authorities are threatening you with hellfire if you misrepresent the narrations in the Quran. And the narrations in the Quran are clear. And those that support the Quran are the Sunnah, are the life and practice of Muhammad as reported by his companions, those who were there, and those that came soon after that. Now, you say, I don't read the record. I just gave you one warning that I do. Because I want to present it to you as you are supposed to take it, not as you're supposed to interpret it with your nearly willy interpretations. Now, concerning Muhammad and his demonic uh, possession, you want a source? Sahih Muslim, chapter 14, book 39, number 6757. Allah's messenger said, There is none amongst you with whom is not an attache or a partner or a companion from amongst the jinn, a devil. The companion said, Allah's messenger, is there a devil with you? Thereupon he said, yes. But Allah helps me against him, so I am safe from his hand, and he does not command me, but for good. So Muhammad acknowledged that he was assigned a specific devil that would guide him. And you can try to justify that any way you want, but you want narrations, you want citations, you want the source materials. I told you in the introduction, we're limited on time. I have all the resources and I'm going to provide them for you. And God willing, a month from today, I'll give a full lecture on the subject with exhaustive references. You want to talk about the sources again? Here's your most authoritative and oldest and most respected biography on the life of Muhammad. I've read this through and through. You can see my highlights are getting out of control. It's falling apart. Here are, here's the narration concerning Muhammad's satanic influence. Muhammad was at the door of the Kaaba, and there's a little variance as to whether he was sitting or standing, whether he was falling asleep during that time or not. That's irrelevant. The fact remains that he was, it says here, not suspecting a mistake or a vain desire or a slip, and when he reached the prostration, and the end of the surah, so Jibreel was revealing something to him, Muhammad was repeating it to the Muslims, and the pagans were there also, in which he prostrated himself. The Muslims prostrated themselves when their prophet prostrated, confirming that what he brought and obeyed his command, and the polyest of Quraysh and others who were there in the mosque prostrated, and they heard the mention of their gods, so that everyone in the mosque Believer, unbeliever, prostrated, except, and it mentions two gentlemen that either had back issues, they picked up dirt, put it on the forehead, and said that suffices. But that's their problem. So we have here to, that Muhammad was speaking the Quran, and during that he was interjected with satanic verses. And he said this, Have you sought Allah al-Uz and Manat the third, the other? 
Satan, when he had he was meditating upon it and designed to bring reconciliation to his people, put upon his tongue, these are the exalted Garanik, whose intercession is approved. There's your source, your dear. The biography of Muhammad. And if you don't like this one, I have several other biographies of Muhammad. I have read his life. I have read what your own scholars say about it and what the historical record says. And if you want to give it some weird interpretation, that's up to you. I'm just telling you the information is there. What was the result of that? Again, it was suicidal tendencies. Muhammad was very depressed. Nadir wants to bring up the, one of the conditions of epilepsy, depression. We have narration after narration that Muhammad was depressed, that he felt like he had betrayed Allah or Allah had abandoned him. He would go to the high peaks and want to cast himself off the, the mountain, but then he would suddenly have a, a convenient revelation that kept him from doing it. Now, I'm not for people committing suicide, but think of the hardship that would have been saved had Muhammad done what he attempted to do. 1,400 years of pain and suffering because of a man who was influenced by a devil, by his own words, and manifested it all through sexual immorality, blasphemies against the true and the living God, thievery, uh, debauchery, greed, warfare. The list goes on. I have a list of Muhammad's sins, and since we're not talking about his specific sins, I'll save that for another time. Maybe we can debate Muhammad's morality next. So, I have one minute left. If you want the references, Nadir, I have them all here. I'm going to post them. Muhammad was led to cross-dressing, contradicting the Quran again, that a man should not, and the Bible specifically. All of these things Muhammad did. He took a child bride. He laid with his dead auntie. He stole from people. He had old ladies murdered for, because he didn't like them. It goes on and on. These are the signs of a demoniac. His signs when he received the revelation are consistent with what we see in the Bible concerning a demoniac. Convulsions, hearing ringing of bells, having weird sensations to smells or reactions. All of these things are consistent. And let me know, are you going to cut me off? I'm noticing your, your time is up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And let's bring up Nadir. You have seven minutes for your rebuttal. Thank you. You know, I don't mean to sound condescending at all, but I'm just going to have to call it out like it is. I think the problem with Lewis is he's not an educated person. You know, I've debated people and I can see their level of education. And and I think the problem is Lewis's mom didn't have forty thousand dollars <laughs> to to send him to school to get a degree in religious studies. My mom did. I wasted most of it, but that's a different story. But anyways, <laughs> you see, he said, oh, no, I don't care about that profile stuff. This is all off topic. Says who? Where are you getting this from? You see, the problem is, Lewis, you you lack education. And my, my argument is, look, if you are an educated person, you're not going to come to the conclusion, which Lewis does, because you can look and you can study. You can build that profile of the demon-possessed prophet and none of what, and, and there's clear similarities. None of what you described tell, uh, you know, is in that profile. And, you know, the problem is, Lewis, I want to remind you again, in a debate, you are to respond and refute to my points, not just repeat your same refuted arguments again and again. You know, and a lot of what you say is fabrication. It's nonsense. It's just not, you try to quote uh, that Sahih Muslim text and you said, oh, the Satan guided him. That's not what the text says. Lewis, you're making things up again. <sighs> okay, we've already talked about satanic verses. You just kept reading and you did not respond to my arguments. I refuted you, uh, uh, you know, well, by pointing out that nothing in that story show that Muhammad did it by intention. That's what Jalalain was pointing out. You did not respond to that. You did not respond to the fact. And again, we're just taking it, uh, uh, you know, that this is an authentic reference, even though it's not. But that's OK. The, the, the story ends. There's a devil and then there's an angel. The angel then comes and clarifies and fixes everything and, um, uh, you know, 
tells basically Muhammad that these things happen. Satan tries to throw things in there. So you want us to believe in this story. The story ends by an angel coming, affirming and protecting Islam. So I'm saying, okay, I accept it now. You were, you did not respond to my points. So you now need to make sense. I, I have already refuted you. The story doesn't make sense if you start from the premise that he's a demon-possessed prophet. If he's a demon-possessed prophet, and let's see, and then what is this whole thing about Satan now coming and trying to throw something on his mouth? The whole thing is from the devil to begin with. <laughs> the story doesn't make sense that way. The only way the story makes sense is if you start from the premise that he's a true prophet of God and thus it's with a satanic attack, then the angel comes and, and basically fixes everything. I don't know of a second way to read that story. <laughs> okay, so maybe you could show us all this nonsense about sexual immorality, warfare, cross-dressing, you know, ringing bells, weird smells. These are all somehow the signs of demons. He's making things up. You know, and it's so, and one of the problems here is chasing after all of these points. If I don't respond to a, something which you hear him say, it's not because I don't have an answer, it's because he's shotgun blasting me with all of these various different points. And it's so hard to chase after all of them. Okay, so the whole thing about the aorta, you know, uh, maybe you could try to talk i don't i didn't understand really what you were saying about there you're a little bit uh, incoherent but it goes back to the death blow to uh you know i think to what he has presented is we go back to the profile in fact i just want to share my desktop here real quick we know how demon possessed prophets walk and talk we know a lot about them carmen if you can kind of share my screen there we and and so everything you described doesn't fit the narrative, doesn't fit our profile. Notice how Lewis had no response to that. We can look at these other prophets and we can see Muhammad doesn't fit that. There's no satanic verses attacking these people because they're already demon possessed prophets. If you're already misleading and deceiving people and you're doing a good job of it, then why does Satan have to come and do all of this throwing satanic verses on your mouth when the whole thing is from Satan to begin with? So this, what you are presenting to us, Lewis, doesn't make sense. You need to get educated. Read about religion. Look and, and see all these demon-possessed prophets like Apostle Paul. You will find nonsense like, who are you, Lord? <laughs> yeah, right. Who are you, Lord? That's a contradiction. First you say that you don't know him, and then you say, you're Lord. These are the type of contradictions which are the true criterias for demonic, for the being that demon possessed prophet. But like I said, he has also ran away from the scientific evidence, which is a smoking gun evidence. I will repeat it again for you, Lewis, since you have ran away from it. How do you explain an alleged demon possessed prophet saving millions of children from fetal alcohol syndrome while the true Lord and Savior let them perish? Th that doesn't make any sense. I gave the analogy of that boy choking and Jesus is just watching him. And Muhammad comes in and rescues him. Who's fitting the, the, the role of the demon-possessed prophet? You know, one of the criterias for you to enter in this debate tonight, Lewis, is I made it very clear when you challenged me, I will be bringing up the scientific evidence. You were aware of that, and we proceeded with this debate. So I will ask for you to please uh, answer the question, and then Jesus is in trouble again with a with a neuroscientist when they say it is the teachings of Christ which causes epileptics to be stigmatized as demon possessed. Because the Bible says they share the same symptom. That was actually Mark nine eighteen. It said he foams at the mouth. He uh, he was shaking and he hit the ground or something like that. I forgot to share share that verse with you. So it is undeniable that the New Testament causes needless misery and suffering in the lives of epileptics. But Muhammad uh, came back and he says, we should pray for them. That's a, from a scientific perspective, that's a much better answer. And so Islam actually removes this horrible stigma, which Christ put on those people, allegedly, again, I don't believe that's Jesus, that Christ put on them according to the scientific research, and Muhammad removed it from them. Okay? 
So that's the smoking gun evidence because prove that Muhammad is not the one fitting that role of the demon-possessed prophet. It's your Lord and Savior which is doing it. Muhammad is removing this in, in, in the suffering and misery caused by your demon-possessed prophet. That's the smoking gun evidence. That is what Lewis is running away from. He has no good answer to that. And that was what Lewis said he would come tonight to answer. That was his criteria here tonight. Okay, so, thank you. Your time is sure, up. No okay, and let me bring uh, Lewis on. So this is the cross-examination um, part. Lewis, you will have seven minutes and you will be in control. So during that seven minutes, um, you if you don't, you can do whatever you want. And then seven uh, minutes for Nadir after you're done, Lewis. So let me... Um, I'll be on here. So go ahead, Lewis. You're all set. Okay, Nadir, what reference would you like that I, you don't think I provided? Well, you made up a lot of stuff here. Uh, I think, yeah, so if one of the uh, references which you act, actually, I mean, one of the fabrications which you actually just recently just said was that you said that the Satan was guiding Muhammad. That is a fabrication. And why don't you go and read the Hadith and you'll see there's no such thing. Okay, let's take a look at that. In Sahih Muslim, chapter 14, book 39, number 6759, says, Aisha, the wife of Allah's apostle reported, Allah's messenger, left my apartment during the night and he came and he saw me in an agitated state. He said, Aisha, what has happened to you? Do you feel jealous? I said, how can it be that a girl like me would not feel jealous in regard to a husband like you? Thereupon Allah's messenger said, it is your devil who has come to you. I said, meaning Aisha, Allah's messenger, is there a devil with me? He said, yes. Aisha says, is there a devil attached to you? He said, yes. I said, Allah's messenger, is there a devil attached to you also? He said, yes. Again, Sahih Muslim, number 6759. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you another question, Nadir. Hold on a second. You, you, mis you did not quote the part. Okay. You, you said that the devil guided him. That's a fabrication. You made it up. You wanted a reference. Deal with it with those who compile. Okay. So you didn't make it up, right? That's not my problem. That's your problem to go and tell Do you make up stuff? It's my problem. It is not my fault that your people said this. No, no, that, that's not in the text which you quoted. Read it again. The, the hadith you quoted where he says, oh, but the, the, the devil's... Okay. You have it right behind. You pulled it from your shelf. Okay, can you please show me the reference where it said the, no. state, the devil that's died? Reference. I gave a reference, and it's on the record. People can look it okay. up. Okay, we, I, I did, did not hear... Can you, I did not hear, hear anything about a devil guiding me or anything like that, Lewis. Well, your Allah says you have a devil, here. Yeah, yeah. All of us have devils, right, yeah. Including Muhammad? Well, if you read the text, it said that Allah controls that and basically... Does he have a devil? Never mind the little details. Does he have a devil? Did he have a devil? But, which is under... Go read the Hadith again. It said he's under you the control know, of... Devil. It was off the tip of your tongue. Just yeah. say yes. Oh, yeah. Everybody has a devil. Including There's Muhammad. no doubt about it. Okay, allow me to speak, please. No, okay, I need to stick to what okay. I'm asking. Did yeah, Muhammad... Yeah, no, everybody... Yeah, if you can read the hadith again, that would be the first one which you read where it talked about. Did Muhammad have a devil? Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, let me talk. <laughs> yes. More than yes okay. or no. You, you, you finish and then well, I, yes I will or, talk. It's a yes or no question. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Everybody okay. has a devil. Okay, will you... I need no more details on that. Okay. Let me well, ask you, you read here. it in context. When you say well, I don't need no more details, well, read it in context. You, have, you oh, asked Lord. the reference I gave okay. you. So you did fabricate about the. Now you're guiding me, so let me you're get and now you're not letting me read it in context. Can, can you yeah, please read, read the... It on your tongue. Okay, okay. You know what? You're not going to let me read it in context. That's fine. You asked for references. I gave the reference. I read it three times already, and you're still not satisfied. You have the book behind you. You're you making can, stuff you up, can dude. Can give us the context for it, but you're unwilling to do that. So now let me ask you another question, dear. By what authority do you interpret the narrations in the Quran? What gives By you what authority? For Muslims and non-Muslims, what the meanings and the context are. What the mean? Well, a lot of it is is apparent in common sense. 
And a lot of it, you could you could go to the tafsir, you could go to the hadith. The Prophet Muhammad, in fact, explained some of it as well. So there's a lot of different ways. And you're doing what I do. You go to the primary source materials. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So why is it that you reject them when I quote them, but then you want people to accept them when you cite them? Like what? Like Muhammad having a devil. Well, you, you got to read it within context. You didn't read it in context. That's a problem. Did you read the context? Other than that, that, that first yeah. hadith you quoted, actually, yeah, you read it in context. context. Well, Lewis, Lewis, you, you, the first hadith you quoted, you read it in context where I can't remember exactly, but you said, okay, everybody had the devil, including me, but God controls well, those devils, and thus the well, devil Muhammad is bewitched. ineffective. That's well, what the hadith says. Was Lewis. Muhammad bewitched? Bewitched? You mean like yeah. had magic put up, upon him? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Oh, absolutely. And that is one of the evidences that you could say this is a true prophet. Because if Muhammad okay, was... Well, let close. Now, let me ask you a question. Did, okay, Muhammad, sure. did Allah not say that he would protect his righteous ones from the influence of Satan, from the influence of the evil eye? Uh, no, I don't think so. You don't know so? Not not from magic, no. Absolutely not. What? Where does magic come from? Magic comes from the devil. And didn't Allah say he would protect his righteous servants from the devil? Mm, not in those exact words. I mean, anybody can fall fall and under evil. For that he would use. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. That's but none of this really. Well, then Muhammad was not protected from the devil. No, no, absolutely not. Because, for example, he got injured in battle. So, no. <laughs> of course not. I mean, that evil can happen to anybody, that. but none of this proves demonic possession. <laughs> if you're being knocked out in battle, it's oh not the same as being, having witchcraft put upon you and having been influenced by it. You see, that, the, okay. you cannot can be influenced by magic or any kind of witchcraft because there is no power in the devil against the Christian on that. But your but, Muhammad was influenced by devils, which is... No, no, that's not true. You're, you're making he, stuff up again. He was terrified by jinns. So this is what I'm trying to get you to understand is okay. that your own sources tell you that your Muhammad was frail, weak, and could not be defended, not even by his Allah. From You're lecturing to me. What's your question? My question is, by what authority do you interpret the Quran the way you do? I want to know why I told you should believe what you're saying versus what I'm reading. Because Muhammad removed the suffering and misery caused by your Lord and Savior. Did Allah not remove it? The part of Satan from Muhammad in cloth. No. So you don't believe your sources that say that Muhammad was taken, opened up, his heart and his entrails were washed with Zanzan water, and the part of Satan was removed. Yeah, his heart was washed. His his heart was washed, but all of that proves what was he washed from? What? Well, read what the story. Washed? Read the story yourself. I have. But, but, okay, that, now you asked me, can I, Lewis, can you allow me to speak, please? See, I'm you can't. To okay. If you don't know, that's fine. Is no, I do. I'm just telling you, but you're not letting me talk. Okay, our well, time, is time, time is up. Time is up. Okay. Time is up. Okay, Nadir, you have seven minutes. Well, I don't want to get too much into your fabrications, like you said that the devil influenced him, or he, the, I'm sorry, that the devil guided him. You made up a lot of weird baloney. And we actually go to the text that doesn't say that. Uh, so I'm not going to go. The issue here is not to prove that you are a fabricator. I don't care. You can come as you are. And But the real issue, I think, the, the real issue here tonight, you know, it, it goes back to, I think, Lewis, it goes back to education. When we look at the profile of the demon-possessed prophet, how do you explain Muhammad not fitting that profile? You're asking me the question now? Yeah. How do you explain Muhammad not fitting the profile of the demon-possessed prophet? Because I showed you a I'm snapshot. Not going, I'm simply taking what your own scholars have reported for us okay, so, concerning the biography of Muhammad. That's not the and, answer. And, which and, I'm and not asking you that. Okay. Can, can, can I share my screen? Are, Carmen, can I share my screen real quick? Thank you. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time here. Put, uh, producing this documentation. I don't think I see my screen yet. <laughs> yeah. Here is a profile of the demon-possessed prophet. How do you explain Muhammad not fitting this profile? Give me some of the details concerning the, the profile. What well, is that's it? That's what we talked about in the debate. Well, one of the... Muhammad one of the double vision. That's not in the profile. Okay, that's, none of, okay, none of this is in the profile. 
discharge. Okay. okay, so you're not able to answer that question. Let's go to the next one. I'm going to be very quickly. Okay. You're, okay, that is clearly not. If you look at these demon possessed prophets, including Paul, uh, none of them exhibit any of the behavior which you cited. And we are forced to assume that they're all demon possessed prophets. I so, mean, going back, you know, I got, we got to go through this very quickly. I'm sorry, we got to go through this very quickly. So, I asked you a question, and you know, we looked at the research here, and I gave you a, a challenge there. I said, How do you explain Muhammad saving millions of children from fetal alcohol syndrome while the true Lord and Savior let them perish? How do you explain? I'm that? dead. He didn't save anybody. Didn't okay, you have. Probably must have fell asleep in the debate tonight. Let me share with you the uh, scientific reference here. I'm quoting from uh, this is uh, this is from the European Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. It states very clearly that because of the Islamic faith, Muslim women are 50 times less than the global average to give birth to a FAS child. In contrast with the Christians. It says they whine as a part of their communion. But so so when you said, no, he, Muhammad is not doing that, I'm sorry, that is absolutely false. The scientific reference is right in front of you. So I repeat my question. question. How do you, what? what? What's the question? How do you explain an alleged false prophet or demon-possessed prophet saving millions of children from FAS while the true Lord and Savior let them perish? How do you explain that? The Mormons abstain from alcohol. That's not the answer to my question. How do you answer that? Well, why is it that you want to take something that is common to many cultures, many peoples, which is to abstain from certain things and give all the credit to Muhammad? It's science who's giving well, the credit, not me. That in okay. Of drinking, Your Lord, okay, that you are diverging from the question. It's not I'm giving credit. It's science giving him credit, and that is a scientific science fact. Science what we know, listen, Lewis, Lewis, what we know is that the Bible from the, from the teachings of Jesus, there's no such credit given. Science has not honored Jesus in any way on this. But what we know is... Hold on. Both, Lewis, let me talk. Let me talk. Both Muhammad and Jesus gave an answer on alcohol. Muhammad's answer is far superior. And so I return to my question. Why wouldn't Jesus do something similar to what Muhammad did? I mean, why would Jesus let all these children perish while the demon-possessed prophet is... Saving these people by his answer. Everything, How do you explain that? Question. Everything Jesus gave us is perfect. Okay, you're preaching. Okay, let's go to the next point. What would so you, you don't have any answer on what that question, which I have for you. Let's go back to the to the uh, to the the thing which actually caused our debate tonight, and that is Mark chapter nine uh, verses eighteen. Well, it was proven from that. science that science basically stated the teachings of Jesus has caused the stigmatization of epileptic people causing their persecution. The Yet, the, Who told you that's what caused the debate? Well, this is what this is no, what you heard about. You debate, okay. well, my question to you is my question to you. Okay, let's, let's step back. Okay. Allow me to answer ask my question. My okay. question to you is how do you explain the true Lord and Savior? causing this type of horrible suffering to epileptics while Muhammad alleviates them from the suffering. How do you explain that? I'm not here to discuss the Bible per se. What I'm here to discuss is Muhammad, epilepsy, and demonic possession. Your own sources no. teach that... You have Muhammad no answer for that as well, like Matt Slick didn't have an answer. You see these Christians run away. So, you know, I, I, this was, I made it very clear in my debate. Um, uh, I, I looked at you and I told you, you're going to have to answer the scientific questions, which is the same one which I raised. So for you to run away from this, uh, uh, that's not an option. So it's just not on topic. No, we're, see, look at, look, it's not, I am who, and you said, I'm, it's not me who's bringing up the Bible. It's Muhammad. It's Muhammad who is copying Word for what's going on yeah, in the Bible. Question. Like for example, hold on, Lewis, Lewis, let me talk. Why is it that you, that the this is my time to talk, Lewis. Okay. It is Muhammad who, if Jesus gave an answer on alcohol, Muhammad gives an alcohol, answer on alcohol. If uh, Jesus gives an al answer on epilepsy, Muhammad gives an answer on epilepsy. It's Muhammad who's doing it because he's showing you he's not the demon-possessed prophet. So I return back to the question, how do you explain the teachings of Jesus causing such horrible suffering by this, by, by in, in epileptics while Muhammad removes that stigmatization from them? How do you explain that? 
Jesus did not do what you said. Jesus okay. came to peace. And Can, I share my screen? Can I share my screen, Carmen? Let's get to the scientific references, which, look, I'm quoting for you Mark chapter 9, verse 18. It talks about the symptoms of that boy. So, as I said, he foams at the mouth, he shivered. Those are all the symptoms of, of uh, 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 he went to the ground, gnashes his teeth. Those are the symptoms of epilepsy. I, I quoted from you two neuroscientists. Now I will quote for you uh, International League of Epilepsy. It says, a passage in St. Mark's Gospel accurately describes tonic-clonic seizure, but concludes that the child contains a spirit of dumbness. In the Christian world, this biblical story led to the belief shared by many people that the epileptics were demonics. This okay, biblical up. story. So for you to deny that, you are just being dishonest. I have knowledge have no of answer to that question. Epileptic tendencies and demonic procession. Okay, we have times times up, guys. Okay, this next round is crossfire. We have a total of seven minutes, but we're going to go one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. Mm -hmm. You guys have to promise me when I say times up, you stop talking because otherwise sure. we will be here forever. Okay, um, let me set my timer. The crossfire is equivalent to the cross-examination, or we're just not going to, we, we can interrupt each other here, correct? You talk and then for one minute, and then he talks for one minute and back and forth. Isn't that how it's done? I'll do it as the moderator says. Okay. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Lewis. Okay. Did When Muhammad received his revelations, supposedly, what were the symptoms? Well, he would shiver a little bit, and uh, that's and he he would be wrapped up, and all of that is very good because when we go back to the profile of the demon possessed you prophet, I just want the oh, list. this is my one minute. This is my one minute, please. Yeah, but I want the list, the symptoms. I don't want any narration. No, I'm I'm giving you my answer. I told you he 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 would shiver, okay. and that was one of the symptoms. And so when we go back to the demon possessed prophet, oh, uh, Lewis, allow me to speak, please. I just want the symptoms. Yes, I told you. Now, let me take my one minute. and I'll, I'll, you know I'll Carmen, I, Carmen I, can you please uh, help us in moderating this? He's uh, interrupting me, and I would I'll like ask to ask a specific minute. question. The you get one minute symptoms. back and forth. Am I correct? Here, a list of symptoms. Okay. Okay. No commentary to it. Okay. Let him answer. Okay, let me, I'm going to take my one minute, please. Thank you. Well, time's about to be up right now. Well, <laughs> you kept interrupting me, so I just want to take my one minute. Okay, thanks. I'm just do my one minute real quick. Okay. okay. So one of so the symptoms, you know, for example, he would shiver. Uh, he would hear a ringing in his in his. Uh, there would be like a bell ringing in the ear. All what I'm telling you, all that is perfectly fine because when we look at the the demon possessed prophets, as we saw from the profile, and that's just a snapshot of about of six compared to like over a hundred. None of the demon possessed prophets which we saw. Exhibit any of these. Uh, my minute, please. Exhibit any of these kind of symptoms. So, so to say that these are demonic symptoms, there's no. Uh, uh, Carmen, I'll ask for it uh, for you to please uh, take my minute without interruption. Yeah. So to claim that these are somehow demonic uh, symptoms, this is nonsense, and there's in complete fabrication. We have a good profile. Our religious studies textbook. We can look at those false prophets like the Apostle Paul and other than them, and we can build a profile. And the question which I have for you is, why are you not using the profile when we have it? Okay, time's up. Nadia, what Islamic sources are you referencing? Wait, hold on. Now it's um, it's his turn to do my the turn? one minute. Okay, so I, I, is it my turn? Oh, yeah. I, I think it's Lewis has got an answer for one minute, I think, right? Yeah. I, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Lewis, please. Nadia, what... Is, Islamic sources have you cited tonight as primary source materials? Is that your one minute or? Okay, well, yeah, actually, you see that this goes well, back to non Muslim materials. Hold on. Oh, can you please allow me to speak, Lewis? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. See, that's the problem. I think it comes back to a lack of education. You should it's not cool. only quote Islamic uh, literature, but we shouldn't look at this matter in a vacuum, which is the way you're doing it. Yeah, You've so got to look at religious studies, textbook, history, science. Use all of this information, we, Lewis. Use all this information we have at our hands and now use that to now determine. If so you have the demon possessed prophet, not. materials to defend your prophet. 
No, no, of course not. We can definitely look at primary source materials. We, we looked at the Quran. Yeah, the, yes, the, the top one about yeah. epilepsy where Muhammad said that I will pray for him. He did not accuse that boy of being demon-possessed. That's primary source material. Okay. Time's okay, up. Turn? Yeah. Okay. So I think the quest, the, the debate, really, I think is is very clear about misery and suffering. Now, I just want to correct you, Lewis. You said that science did not accuse Ma, uh, Jesus uh, or the teachings of the Bible of stigmatizing yeah, epileptics. Yeah, that is not uh, Lewis. Allow me to take my one minute, Carmen. I'll have to ask for my for the please stop interrupting me. I want. Can you share my desktop, please? Yeah. Well, Representing. Thank you. So, so the, the scientific evidence clearly vindicates Muhammad of any of this. And, and as I said, if you could see my screen over here, I'm showing you the reference. It explicitly puts two references, actually, three references, actually, I have. Three scientific references which put the blame on the teachings of Jesus for stigmatizing epileptics as being demon-possessed, which would then lead to their persecution and suffering. Because now they walk around, because of Mark 9.18, when it talked about that boy you know, who was allegedly demon possessed, those were the symptoms. He said he, he threw himself on the ground, foamed at the mouth. Those are the symptoms of epilepsy. So now these people are getting stigmatized. So my question to you is, how do you explain that your Lord and Savior stigmatize these people, according to science, while well, Muhammad removed yeah. that stigma yeah. from them? How do you explain that? Okay, time's up. Okay, time. you got a minute. I do have a minute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Nadir, what primary source materials have you read on the life of Muhammad to conclude that he was not demon-possessed? We read through, through the satanic verses. I actually shared my desktop. I showed you there. I said that nothing he did over there was his fault. He had no intention to do that. And I showed where the angel then came and rectified all that. Then you said you should accept this as authentic. I said, okay. What? What was rectified? Well, the, did you not read the story yourself? I'm just asking, what was rectified? Okay, the story concludes right after the devil part, then the angel Gabriel comes. What's the devil part? The devil part is where he maliciously tried to throw words did on he Muhammad. Did he succeed? What? Oh, yeah, he absolutely succeeded because people heard it, yeah. So Muhammad, the devil succeeded in putting something into Muhammad's mouth right. that was not from Allah. That was and it was not his intention. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. I'm sorry. And so, just since we're on this, since you've, uh, I think you had no response on epilepsy. I do want to give you a last opportunity to answer the question because the evidence for why we say Muhammad is a true prophet of God and not a demon possessed prophet is because he removed the suffering and misery which the demon possessed prophet causes his followers when they accept him as Lord and Savior. And for that, you had no response at all. You tried to deny the scientific evidence. It was then repeated back at you. But I do want to finish you off on, on the issue of satanic verses because the story you quoted from ends with an angel of God coming and rectifying the situation and saying, it's okay, whatever the devil threw in, I'm going to throw out. None of this had anything to do with Muhammad's intention. And so the question tonight is, you told us to accept this as an authentic story. So then this story actually proves Muhammad is a true prophet because it has an angel of God taking his side. Can you not see how your own argument has defeated you tonight? Did Allah not claim that he would protect his righteous servants? Okay, you have one minute to respond to that. Okay, are you done? Well, I had a question didn't Allah say he would protect his righteous servants? You're shifting the goalposts. No, the answer is no. Uh, Satan can attack, uh, but the, what, what the... Oh, sure. Hold on, let me... You asked me a question. We're what, talking about shirt. We're not talking about minor sin. Akbar yes. sin. Okay, you finish your one minute, then I'll respond, okay? Well, you're not answering the specific question. Did Allah not say he would protect, and according to the scholars, his righteous servants from committing major sins? Is shirk a major sin? Yes, it's a major sin, correct. Did Muhammad not commit shirk when he said that the intercession of the pagan goddesses was to be accepted? No, because he had no intention so of doing that. He didn't even know that he was God saying that. And making them partners with Allah is not shirk? He didn't do it intentionally. The first hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Okay, can you allow me to speak? The first is shirk an unforgivable sin? Okay, you're not understanding of this. I'm trying to get you to follow the line of reasoning. 
Allah said shirk is an unpardonable sin. Muhammad committed okay. shirk. Let me, let me take my one minute, okay? So it looks like, you know, you are not able to understand that, you know, your argument on satanic verses has been refuted very badly because it's actually a story endorsing how Islam is to be protected. Now, the whole thing about did Allah protect his servant or something like that. Look, this is, I'm quoting from Surah Jinn, just as chapter number 28. This is what it says here. He appoints an angel as guards before and behind them to make sure that the messengers fully deliver the messages of their Lord, even though he already knows about them he, and keeps account. So the angel is protecting the message here. That's that's what the role of the and that's exactly what we read inside the alleged satanic verses which are quoting, which i got 15 seconds here so so the story actually proves muhammad is a true prophet because the angel as what we read over here ensures and makes sure the message remains pure muhammad had no intention of doing that as jalalain pointed out okay your, right. own, your own scholars have made it very clear that the prophets were infallible in and conveyed the message from Allah. They are very clear, such as as Safarini said, Al Qadi Iyad said, the Muslims are unanimously agreed that the prophets were infallible and protected from committing shameful deeds and major sins that doom a person. And over and over again, and the list goes on, of your scholars, again, I'm not going outside of Islamic scholarship, have clearly said, that Allah would protect his prophets from major sins. Committing shirk is a major sin that could condemn somebody to hell according to Islamic. <laughs> Allah allowed Muhammad to be influenced by the devil to the point of committing shirk, bowing down in the worship and acceptance of the intercession of the pagan gods and goddesses. This was celebrated by the people and the pagans. Not one minute, Carmen. Yep, it's up. Time's up right okay. now. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. We, we're done here, I think. We did our seven minutes already yep. of Crossfire. So now we're entering into the conclusion. And, Louis, you get four minutes for that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Nadir. Thank you, Carm. Thank you, m to m Ministries. And thank you to the audience for taking care of this day. Lord say to, to, to men argue. <laughs> uh, but hopefully the benefit will be this, that those who are following and being influenced by the religion of Islam, founded supposedly by a man known as Muhammad in 7th century Arabia, that has had negative repercussions throughout 14 centuries, 1400 centuries, you will now see that this is a man to avoid, a religion to avoid, and you need to be directed to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation and for righteous living. Now, Nadir said that I don't read the references. I can't put every book I have here on the screen, but these are my personal books concerning Islam. I have the entire set of the volumes. I have the references to all of the narrations on the Satanic Verses. This is the book, Satanic Before Orthodoxy. I've read, I've gone through it, I've commented on it. The information is there. People simply need to do their homework and study it out. As I said, I'm going to give a more full and exhaustive lecture specifically on this topic with all the references, all the narrations, and commentary. Nadir cannot defend his prophet. He has admitted that the devil had power over him, that he was touched by the devil, that he Allah allowed him to be to have words interjected that were not from Allah. The redaction, the abrogation does not save Muhammad because according to Islamic scholars, he should have been protected. When the devils that appeared to him, they call them angels, removed the part of Satan from Muhammad's heart, that was re like removing the window through which Muhammad would come in and influence someone. Supposedly, Muhammad was protected from the devil, yet he contradicted that. Allah threatened Muhammad that he would kill him in a specific way by severing his life's artery, the aorta, and that he would be one of the losers if he spoke on behalf of Allah erroneously or told something that Allah did not say. That is exactly how Muhammad died. The true and the living God allowed for the humiliation of the so-called prophet Muhammad to die the death of a false prophet by his own standards. The question of the demonic influence on Muhammad 
is without doubt. How the Muslims try to reconcile it and try to justify it, for instance, the invention of, oh, well, he can't commit certain sins, or even though he did commit the sin, it was redacted. It's too late. You can't take it back. He muddied the waters, and you're, there is no filter that will ever clean that mess up. So Muhammad did, in fact, get influenced by demons. The result of that was that he had symptoms that were consistent with a demonic possession and with epilepsy. So my conclusion is that Muhammad was both an epileptic and a demoniac. Satan used the brain damage that Muhammad suffered from the birth canal, concerning the compression of the brain and the damage of the frontal lobe that produced these hallucinations, the auditory hallucinations, the body tremors, the fear, the confusion, the desire for spiritual things. This we do see with epileptic people, that they have some kind of a heightened spirituality about them. For whatever reason, that is consistent with that. Now, is that clearly a sign of satanic uh, possession or oppression? Not necessarily, but it's, it, it does follow that it's both and. And I have a list of Muslim scholars agreeing that epilepsy is a result of satanic possession and influence. That the demons, according to Muslim scholarship, can influence you physically and psychologically. And we see that with Muhammad. Muslim scholars themselves give the list of the symptoms that would follow a demoniac. And they are consistent with the life of Muhammad, according to the biographies, the life of Muhammad, the Syrian literature. We have the narrations concerning the issue of the satanic verses. I have the 50 accepted narrations right here listed. Nadir, I don't think, has done his homework. He wants to say, I haven't gone to spend $40,000. My poor mother, although she worked, couldn't afford to give me the proper schooling. But that is a shame to him, because if an uneducated, unscholarly person like myself can present the facts the way Muslim scholars present them, and yet Nadir doesn't understand them, rejects them, and refuses to receive them, it's a shame on him who does have the education. What does that mean? Give the money back to the university, Nadir, because they failed you. Okay. Come to Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior, and you will have true peace in him and him alone through the gospel. Okay, thank you, Lewis. And Nadir, you have four minutes. You're muted. Turn, turn. Okay, I fixed it. It's on. Okay, it's on. Okay. Yeah. Welcome. So one of the one of the biggest uh, problems of tonight's debate is uh, Lewis is a fabricator. But I didn't want to turn this debate into what a big liar Lewis is and how he misquoted texts to create this false narrative. I didn't want to do that. I just want to give the smoking gun evidence. And I think I did that. Now, we did catch him in a big lie where he said Satan, he tried to misquote the text and he got caught. I only caught him in one lie, I have to admit tonight. I just didn't want to go out and chase after every lie he was saying. But I asked the audiences, please do, you know, give me the benefit of the doubt and, and say, hey, listen, when you quote a reference, you should, I mean, when you mention something, you should quote the reference, which he didn't do tonight. Most of what he's saying is not actually found in our Islamic text. I did catch him on the one where he said the Satan guided him or something like that. That's not what the text says. Everybody has a Satan with him. But when it, he said, even you, Muhammad, he said, yes, but those Satans are locked down or chained down or something like that. That's what the text actually said. How does this prove demonic possession? If that's the case, everybody's demon possessed. It's silly. Nothing, the criteria he gave tonight was basic stuff we, which he's just made up out of his head. We, the issue tonight, I think it, it came down to the lack of education. Looking at this matter in just a vacuum is silly. I showed you from the, we should compare it with that religious studies textbook, history, science. But if you, what you saw tonight was Lewis ran away from all of that. And I say he ran away from it because he doesn't have that educational background. I don't mean to put him down, but that's. But I think when you are an educated person, you're never going to look at Muhammad as a demon-possessed prophet. You just won't. Okay. Sadly, I wasn't able to. He shotgun blasted all of these alleged, you know, things which Muhammad did. I didn't get a chance to chase after all of them. So I let him get away with a lot tonight, and I'm regretful. But I'm not a Superman. I can't confront him on every lie which came out of his mouth. 
you know, like this nonsense he was saying about the aorta. What can I do? This is my four minutes. I got to sum up everything. So I can't catch him on everything. Rather, the my strategy, which I think worked, and I just give the smoking gun evidence. Give the smoking gun evidence. It has been proven from science today that that if that you know if you compare the teachings of Jesus and Muhammad, of course we believe in Jesus, but not the the version which is found in the New Testament. There's there's some very considerable differences there. We know both Jesus and Muhammad gave answers on epilepsy and alcohol. We know that. What we now know is that Muhammad saved millions of children from fetal alcohol syndrome while his true Lord and Savior, if we're to go with that, let them perish. It's not Muhammad fitting the role of the demon-possessed prophet here. It's Jesus, the Jesus which the Christians believe in. Science has given a death blow to the religion of Christianity. That's why Lewis ran away from it. We, we also saw the same thing with, with, with epilepsy. Science, I have three scientific journals all stating the same thing. They're blaming the Bible, the teachings of Jesus for stigmatizing epileptics. And this is something which we know demons do. If you notice people who are vulnerable, for example, unborn babies, and, and people who have disabilities, stigmatizing them that you're a demon possessed so that they can get persecuted in society. Muhammad comes back 600 years later and removes that horrible stigma put upon epileptics. This is a smoking gun evidence I present to you today, proving that Muhammad is a true prophet of God. And all the rantings of Lewis's that you heard tonight, I only got a chance to chase after some of them. I didn't get a chance to chase after all of them. But the key point here, like when we look at the issue of magic, you can't, this doesn't make sense that a demon-possessed prophet, that Satan is going to put magic on his demon-possessed prophet when he's already misguiding everybody. Satan doesn't do that because we saw that in the profile. He simply doesn't do that. If he's demon-possessed already and he's misguiding everybody, Satan is just going to sit back and let, let let everything you know play out. The only way you can make sense of these stories is you start out that he's a true prophet of God, and thus Satan tries to attack him with magic. There's no other way you can make sense of these stories which Lewis is mentioning. And he was not able to respond to that. He just kept repeating and kept, you know, shotgun blasting us with all his fabrications and nonsense. So I think tonight's debate is an open and shut case. Muhammad is a true prophet. And unfortunately, the Jesus of the Bible has to be added to the list of the demon-possessed profile, which we have saw with all those other uh, charlatans and canards. But it doesn't mean that Jesus is not the true Messiah. He is. It's just not the version given to us in the New Testament, okay. as science has clearly proven that. Thank you so much. So, wow. Um, I want to thank both of our um, debaters today. I would like to thank the chat for being on their best behavior. Well, maybe not best behavior, but you guys were really good. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate our debaters for um, speaking. And we are not going to have a Q&A today, but I do want to tell you guys that we are live every Sunday at 4 p.m. Central and 7 p.m. Eastern time. And the second Sunday, next month on the second Sunday, Lewis will be our guest and his topic will be Mohammed. So I would like to thank everyone. Um, Pastor George, are we are we done? We're done. You're muted. You're muted. Yes, we are done for today. Thank you so much, everybody. But uh, I want to tell you that the second Sunday of every month, Louis Linehart will be with us. And his specialty is he going to continue going after Muhammad officially. Uh, would you please join us next month? And thank you, Nadir. Thank you for uh, your willingness uh, to take uh, tough topics. Um, and maybe still, we will talk more. Thank you, Nadir. Thank you, Nadir. Thank you, Nadir. Thank you, Nadir, for taking the shotgun square head on. And... Uh, I don't think one pellet missed you. So <laughs> now 
<laughs> what? All right, maybe we can arrange Anthony Wright to debate with Nadia, right? Because the science has already rendered the verdict, Muhammad is a true prophet. He's not going to be able to handle the scientific evidence. He'll be destroyed. Right, wait a minute, wait a minute. Like, Nadir, are you talking like, to me? Yeah. yeah, I'm talking to you. All right, then let's debate. Okay, what's the topic? Science, uh, does science topic. prove Muhammad? Any topic. We could debate, is Nadir Ahmed demon-possessed? We could debate, is mm -hmm. Muhammad a true prophet? We can debate whether Allah is a true prophet. Does science prove Muhammad, Muhammad a true prophet? We debate whether Muhammad was an immoral man for pillaging and robbing caravans. It's all lies. You're just killed. a liar. We can talk yeah. about whether Muhammad had poets killed. Okay, just okay, okay. look, I'm giving you the topic. I'm happy look. to take you on, Nadir, anytime you Carmen, want. Carmen, I'm okay. giving you the, I'm sorry, not Carmen, I mean, uh, Anthony, I'm giving you the topic. Does science prove Muhammad a true prophet? We can start with that. And then we can talk about violence and all these other things. No problem. Wait a minute, let's wait start a with that. Nadir. And Nadir. I'm going to barbecue you. Nadir, Nadir. Okay. You have any education in science? Well, yeah, you, you you were claiming that Lewis was not yeah. educated. You're wrong. Yeah. But I want to know if you have any education in science so that you can have any confidence in this debate. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You, what's your education? Well, I graduated from Bradley University with a with a bachelor's in religious studies. But my minor was Wait, in, I said in science. OK, what's your minor? My minor was in biology. And I've worked for the last 30 years in information technology. And a lot of that has to do uh, with science. I, I see information technology yeah. is not. But no, it has to deal yeah, with science. To on any topic. Okay, look, I listen, the thing is this, that one thing you need to be informed of, uh, you know, when we talk about the scientific evidence for Islam, the atheists and agnostics have already given their endorsement that Muhammad corrected six scientific errors in the Bible. So don't tell me I don't have good evidence because it has convinced them. Evidence. I've heard all your evidence. Nadir. Okay, good. You're ready to let's, do this let's debate? debate it. Let's debate let's it. Let's debate it. Does science prove Muhammad? What do you eat now, Nadir? We're going to talk about that. You get your... Okay, Nadir. And I'm going to barbecue third, you. Third Sunday, Bible. not of this month, the third Sunday of next yeah. month. Yes. Okay. Nadir, you cannot build your evidence on science. Nadir, why? Claiming science. Mm -hmm. uh, well, do, you, do you believe in evolution? Well, some of it I do. Oh, come uh -oh. on, Nadir. Come on, Nadir. Look, the, the issue which Anthony has to answer tonight in this debate, when, when it comes, is did Muhammad correct six scientific errors in the Bible? That's what he's got to face. And um, Let me ask you a oh, question, Nadir. Yeah. Why are you so fixated on the sciences as opposed to defending Islam from a scholarly perspective with Islamic materials? Because that's what educated people do. Once you understand the science and how religion so uh, you're saying, like, yeah. well, because to, I'm just giving you my thinking. Because you're uneducated. I, as a Christian, I don't need to go like Lacona and McClatchy, these guys that try to appeal to, they do kind of what you do. I don't need to do those things to defend. You don't do it because you're uneducated. God. I stick to the word of okay. God with that. Right. Why do you need to go to what you your mm -hmm. religion would consider unclean, both ceremonial, both religiously mm -hmm. and otherwise, people that are enemies of Allah, why would you go to them and their philosophies and sciences to defend your Allah and his Muhammad? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, I don't I'll answer you. I'm trying to why you keep going to those topics. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer you because there's nothing unclean about science. And like I told you, my mom paid $40,000 for me to get an education. And I'm using that education, which I got. And got I can, another 40, and, and, that I can you know. Use. And so I think it goes back to education, that once you're an educated person, you can now look at history, you can look at religious studies, you can look at science, and you can see how all this, uh, how religion plays a role in all that, and science does endorse and prove Muhammad to do a, to be a true prophet. There are not Christian scientists yeah. in, in every well, look, uh, like I said, I, I think I've given you the answer. I think it's just a matter of education. Go to college, get an education, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Nadir, Nadir, don't uh -huh. make a big deal of an uneducated man because Muhammad was not. He Muhammad was, was he was not illiterate. He was an ignorant besides being demon possessed. Uh, may, maybe there's an issue there in the Quran. Mm -hmm. If you're rejecting people that without education, you should reconsider the science and the Quran and all that stuff because Muhammad was not an educated man. Uh, but Nadir, thank you so much. Thank you All so right. much for accepting the debate. And the third Sunday of May, you will right. be debating Anthony Rogers. On the scientific evidence for Islam. It's gonna, it really should focus on does science 
does Muhammad correct the scientific mistakes of the Bible? So Are that's you, really what the topic should be. Whether or not the Quran is scientifically accurate. Oh, we you can do that one too. There's two different debates. Before, so don't run from it now unless no, you're no, no. I love that debate. confidence okay. in the scientific miraculous nature of the Quran, then we can okay. debate whether the Quran is scientifically accurate. Yeah. Okay, yes, definitely. I'd love that debate. If uh, uh, We can do that, but I see that as two Good. different let's do it. Don't run from it. Let's do it. Okay, but what about does Muhammad correct the scientific errors of the Bible? We can, talk about, we can Bible. talk about a second debate after you're able to vindicate okay. your false definitely. prophets. Corrupt okay, no problem. We will talk about the first debate will be does Islam does does science contradict Islam? We can do that okay, first okay. debate. Okay, oh, no problem. Let's change it again. It does the is the Quran scientifically accurate? Okay, sure. It, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's no what problem. We'll but the second debate will be about we'll Muhammad debate. correcting the scientific error of the Bible. Prophet got the science right. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, right, Carm. Thank you, Carm. Thank you, Nadir. And uh, we see you guys. Uh, Next week uh, is the third Sunday of the month. Then is Anthony, Anthony Roger is the speaker for next Sunday. Okay. Uh, we'll see you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, dear. No, but it's it's it's. it's, it's.